Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. A look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. The first issue is what did the people want to accomplish? They had a vision of the future of man at a higher level of existence. They viewed man in a very high destiny. Going with that, they wanted to have a fundamental change in the powers of workers and the people that made investments. They needed to change the geography of the country. They needed machines that hadn't existed before. Opposed to them was the British Empire as a system, including the Southern slave owners. And they were part of a worldwide imperial system. They viewed man completely differently than our leaders did. And they had a very cynical and morbid idea of man and his future. So this is the distinction between these two systems. That brief historical rendering by today's guest on It's Our Money, Anton Chetkin, was describing the context and dynamics of America's initial focus on infrastructure development at the start of our country. As with any historical narrative, there's more backstory than usually gets reported, and today we're fortunate to have Anton Chaitkin, whose remarkable research in his new book, Who We Are, digs deeper into the economic and social drivers that set America on the pursuit of establishing itself with higher human values, and how it met with the resistance of global oligarchs who wanted to keep America under their thumb with the idea of keeping its citizens maintained as pawns and serfs. Hello, and welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. I'm Walt McCree, Ellen's co-host and senior advisor to the Public Banking Institute. Ellen will be talking with Anton Chetkin in just a moment. We think you'll find his encyclopedic knowledge and insights to be very valuable reference points these days as we see America taking a new, more serious look at its infrastructure needs as well as its economic and social integrity. As you're no doubt aware, infrastructure investment is a leading topic in Washington, D.C., as we've discussed on this program recently, an analysis of the multiple trillions of dollars that are needed for investment, and a look at some of the financial methods that are being discussed to enable them. Well, while these days we presume it's foolish to not take care of our roads and bridges, at the outset of our country about 200 years ago, there was actually a lot of resistance to investing in foolish things like the Erie Canal, which helped transform the economy of early America and made New York City what it is. Chicken observes that the imperialist moneyed elites in both London and America intended to keep the rabble of citizens everywhere stuck in lives with little promise but to keep working for their security, never really rising above the point of production of profits for the owner class, never being able to acquire the privilege of the higher elements of life for which humanity was believed to be destined in our country. As you listen, Chaitkin also points to a shift in our socioeconomic values that has taken place through the financialization of our economy in the last 50 years, and which returns citizens to the level of indentured servants by the power of monetary debt. The historically obscene disparity of inequality in our economy and the deprivations that accompany it are all vestiges of a history of economic tyranny driven by extractive and hoarded capital. Today's historical retrospective on the economic dynamics of America's early days reminds us once again that the struggle for democratic influence and control of our money is a constant battle against the money powers in the world that don't consider the human prospect any more important than a bottom-line figure. Let's bring in Ellen.
It's my pleasure to be speaking to you, Anton Chetkin, uh, who is a historian, former political activist, and author of three books and hundreds of articles. His latest book, uh, which came out late last year, is called Who We Are, America's Fight for Universal Progress from Franklin to Kennedy, Volume 1, 1750s to 1850s. So that covers like the history of the United States up to the Civil War. And then uh, there is a forthcoming <laughs> book on this up till the present. So Anton, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. Thanks, Ellen. It's very good to be with you. Okay, so what I, of course, we focus on this show on money and banking. And uh, what I particularly liked about your book was that it, uh, it's actually inspiring. A lot of people today are you're not real proud of being American. <laughs> we seem to, I mean, you've, taught, you've gone into the American system versus the British system, and I'll let you explain what that is, but um, we seem to be reverting to the British system, which is kind of imperialism, or as uh, John Adams said, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword and the other is by debt, and we seem to be doing both of them <laughs> abroad. But it wasn't always that way, and we definitely had an inspiring and uh, inspiring history. So, could you explain what we were up against, and you know, just sort of give a capsule summary of that first period in our history? Yeah, you have to start with the mission of the founders, the mission that you can easily see by looking at what they believed in, what they did, and what they accomplished in a, in a fight that went on throughout the history of the country. Um, the first issue about the uh, banking or money or economy is the question of sovereignty. Uh, really, it's the election. It, it's the question of, of self-government. Uh, this means if, if you have the sovereignty of the elected government to make decisions for the country, uh, that's better than the sovereignty over the country by private power which would be through uh, financial centers, uh, through uh, states uh, and oligarchy operating through state governments and uh, also operating through foreign empires. So the, do the people have the right to govern themselves and shape the destiny of themselves as a people and their country? Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was the most uh, uh, bold and audacious in stating this very plainly, that you had private power uh, that uh, sought to control everything. It was a dictatorship, unless you have a government that acts uh, for the people and is completely uh, uh, working with the people uh, to, to fight for their rights. So th this is the background of the, the, the founding of the country. Uh, you have to situate that in the real strategic reality at the time of the founding. They had just had these enormous breakthroughs in England uh, in industrial technology. The steam engine, the canals, uh, it was very sudden. And in the 1780s, when we finished our Revolutionary War and, and made the Constitution, uh, that had just happened. It, it was just at the cusp of this breakthrough in England. U.S. was very weak. We were confined to the East Coast. Uh, we were, uh, our, our economy was largely confined to raw material production, exporting it to the mother country. And we had to break out of this if we were going to sustain our independence. Um, so to, to look at what the mission was, really, you have to look at the core leadership. And I, I, I show in the book, in this first volume, that there was a, a, a kind of a, a quasi-executive of the country for the American Revolution. The, the, probably the three principal figures in, in that e executive were General Washington, Benjamin Franklin as diplomat and strategist, and 
Robert Morris. Uh, they had uh, associates largely operating in Philadelphia with them, including Alexander Hamilton, uh, including Morris's close uh, colleagues, uh, Governor Morris, no relation, and James Wilson. They had a bank during the revolution and, and sh shortly after that, the Bank of North America. Uh, the, the purpose of this whole thing was to finance the army as best they can, the Congress wouldn't do it. This, this core leadership continued as a small group, really, uh, with, with common ideas. Uh, with Franklin, uh, really the, the, the great uh, inspirer. Uh, this group essentially composed the US Constitution. And out of this group came the program that Hamilton put forward at the, at, in the founding days of the uh, US Republic, including the Bank of the United States and an industrial development program. You, you talk a lot about infrastructure and industrial development, and of course, that's a major crisis we're facing today. I think we need at least $5 trillion worth of infrastructure, and that the normal choices are go into debt or tax the people, and neither one is, you know, both are pretty unpopular at the moment. But, um, and the other alternative is a national infrastructure bank, which of course I'm totally in favor of. But um, in in the Washington and um, the, I mean, the, the founding fathers were faced with the same problem. They were in debt, the states were heavily in debt, they needed infrastructure. So can you explain a bit how they did it? And also of course, Lincoln and Roosevelt, they all had the same problem of being, facing massive uh, financial crises and still somehow they managed to do brilliant infrastructure projects, so. All right. So you have to bring in a couple of other elements into this issue because it doesn't work simply on the basis of uh, financial considerations and the way they're usually seen. The first issue is what did the people want to accomplish who were promoting a transformation of the economy? They had a vision of the future of man at a higher level of existence rather than simply toil, toiling, you know, dust to dawn and being limited in their, in their uh, powers. They saw, they, they viewed man in a very high destiny. Uh, they were optimistic people. And, and going with that, they wanted to have a change, a fundamental change in the powers of uh, the uh, workers and the and the the people that made investments. What what would people be able to accomplish? So they needed totally new technology. They needed to change the geography of the country, breaking through the Appalachians. They needed uh, uh, machines that did, hadn't existed before. Opposed to them, and this is the other element you have to bring into this was the British Empire as a system, including the Southern slave owners, uh, exporting first tobacco and rice and then cotton. And they were part of a worldwide imperial system. They wanted to stay in that system, in a semi-colonial status. What did that system and its leadership in London want? First of all, they viewed man completely differently than we did, than our leaders did our best leaders. They, they viewed human beings as mere animals. And they had a very cynical and morbid idea of man and his future, constant wars and so forth. They decided at, as, a, as an imperial leadership, uh, at, at the point that they had seen the Industrial Revolution in England, they decided in London that no other country would get these powers then they could rule the world or that system could rule the world. So these are the two ideas of what's gonna happen. One of them says we, we have to transform the economy and our, and our powers as a country with a higher level of technology, a higher level of culture, of skill to fulfill our destiny as human beings. And they spread that idea to many other countries, Germany, Japan, Russia, 
uh, e even countries in the British uh, Empire, like Canada and Australia, the, the American idea of progress in that sense, greater powers over nature, an optimistic view of man. So this is the distinction between these two systems. It was squelched in our country uh, in the 1790s. Hamilton's program for the bank was established and it helped stabilize the economy, but it did not uh, really accomplish the uh, industrial transformation that was needed uh, right away. Uh, Jefferson's uh, perfidious intervention and the uh, British dumping and the creation of the rotten two-party system stalled this for a generation, for a whole generation, really. We did not industrialize until after the War of 1812, when a new... Um, a new generation of leaders came in uh, and they were heirs of Franklin. They had the same vision. They were very personally tied to the revolution uh, in their outlook and in their personal lives. And they uh, put through a completely new policy for the country based on the, the original founding mission. And, and to understand this, you have to, again, you have to get into the story of who these people are that led this revolution in our policy. Without that, people talk about trends or forces, you know, whether it's a communist talking about economic determinism or, or some stupid sociologist telling you that the conditions of the population somehow resulted in this and that. Where's the ideas? Where's the fight? There was a huge fight going on. The Southern slave owners uh, acting in concert with uh, this, this crowd in New York and London fought uh, a bloody fight to stop the industrialization of the country. And this shows, by the way, that all of this woke baloney that's being peddled now about our history misses the whole point. Yes, the racists and racism and slavery was a big problem, was a big issue. But the racists have no claim to have built up this country. They tried to stop it. It was built by people who opposed the entire imperial structure, including racial-based slavery. So this is a, the real history depends on knowing who actually built the country. And that's for then and for later. So. Uh, you, you mentioned about, so it, if we can just encapsulate. So I think American system is basically sovereignty. We issue our own money. We issue our own credit. We have um, uh, protect, protective policies that protect our young fledgling uh, companies, including tariffs. Um, so it's sort of a nationalist protectionist system. Um, you mentioned that they, uh, in, meaning the British, were, were all about um, keeping the system in a sort of feudalistic model where they're sort of exploiting other countries and exploiting their resources or whatever. So who can I ask who, can we call the, the they, would that be the British bankers? Or, I mean, it seems to me we have the same thing going on today, but they're using yes. our current government or our current country or, you know, our current system is getting exploited in a similar way. We have the system that, that has power over the United States at present is called globalism. And it, it, it's, its centers are financial centers and also st uh, strategy making centers. It, it, Washington is part of it. London is a big part of it. New York and other places. There's also a, an offshore banking system. And the if world economic back, world. <laughs> Yeah, this is a completely criminal system. And mm -hmm. it, 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 you have to refer to the criminal system at the time that we broke with, with Britain. The, the, the English economy was not criminal. The, 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 the great inventions and thinkers who, who made advances there that I, I detail in, in the first chapter of this book, 
Wedgwood and Bolton and Watt and, and Priestley, these people were giants. They, and they were friends of, of Franklin, they were Republicans. But the system was theft, pure theft. It was going to India to loot and close industries. It was going to China to, uh, to stupefy them with dope. It was using intrigue and overthrow of governments to, to force other countries to, to uh, be, continue in poverty. This was the, the British Empire system. Now, how did we, you have to ask, how did we, I think you mentioned this before, how did we finance the infrastructure that was built in the 19th century? In the first phase, the outstanding uh, developments in infrastructure were canals and railroads. And this did not happen just gradually. This started all at once. Uh, you, first of all, you start with a team of men, and that includes Nicholas Biddle as president of the Bank of the United States, Henry Clay, the leader in Congress, uh, DeWitt Clinton, uh, uh, the governor of New York, John Quincy Adams, president of the United States, Matthew Carey, uh, the economic strategist, and uh, principally uh, General Joseph Gardner Swift, the man who, trans who, who managed the transformation of West Point into an industrial development center. These six men that I, I document in the book acted as a team. They had the common vision for the future. They were very optimistic and they were very realistic people. They were powerful thinkers. And the way that the, uh, the infrastructure was built, it's very simple. If you sweep away a lot of the rhetoric, pro and con about, about infrastructure, uh, the, we had the Erie Canal, which was state financed. Jefferson and Madison refused to finance on a federal basis. DeWitt Clinton was part of the team with these other men that developed the Midwest uh, 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 canals. The federal government under John Quincy Adams put out land grants uh, and, and uh, these were for the states that were developing this system in uh, Ohio and Indiana and then Illinois. Uh, there was involvement of the federal, of, of the uh, army engineers. Uh, this entire system of canals that connected the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes and to the Mississippi River when it was finished was a project of our country, of our nation. Uh, and the railroads were similar. It was the same thing. The railroads were financed by government national, state, and local governments. Army engineers designed the first railroads. Uh, they were assigned by John Quincy, President Adams. Uh, the, the US Army uh, ha developed a, an adjunct manufacturing facility at West Point called the West Point Foundry. They built America's first locomotives. They were built at the West Point Foundry. All of the railroads were community projects. That is, you'd have seed money that would come from government at some level. And they had community objectives and national objectives. The Secretary of War for John Quincy Adams, Philip Barber, uh, said, you know, said we, we're assigning these engineers to the Baltimore and Ohio, the first railroad, these army engineers, because this is, has a national strategic purpose. So the idea that some robbers in Wall Street or Rothschild in England built our railroads is just wrong. It's totally false. They put their money into things after they were built or, or while they were being built because with the Bank of the United States ensuring a good flow of credit to uh, productive enterprises and holding back on speculation and, and robbery, by, by irresponsible private banks, uh, private investors could, knew they could make uh, a, a good return by investing in things that were useful to the community.
And that, that was the railroads and canals and so forth. That was, these were part of our national mission. That's how you have to understand how this was done. What's the issue today? Just let me finish with this, or this thought. Uh, what do we have to accomplish with our infrastructure? We are a backward country relative to other countries. Relative to our own needs, we are uh, tragically backward in our infrastructure and in our industry and in our science. So if you say, let's repair some bridges, and then you fight over whether daycare is part of this so-called infrastructure, you're totally missing the point. We have to transform the country with new infrastructure. There's a suppression of a debate and discussion on this. It simply, uh, you know, trickling in money or, or just spending money and pouring money out to some group or to even to poor people is going to accomplish absolutely nothing except inflation and, and, and chaos. You have, to, you have to have a gigantic new infrastructure in place, high speed trains have to be put in place, new transit systems, new systems of all kinds in the cities. You have to have nuclear power plants. There's no way to provide the level of uh, energy throughput that's needed in the United States or in other places in the world, like Africa that has a disaster of, of 500 million with no uh, electricity. You need nuclear power plants. You can't do it with windmills and solar power. Uh, and you have, to, you have to look forward to the future in, 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 a, in a huge investment in science, in, in the most far-reaching science, with the space program, with biological research, with medical research. These things are critical. What will happen if we don't do these things? China, Russia, and other countries that are going forward with their economies in this way are going to outclass us and what that will lead to based on our current leadership and, and, and system is it will lead to a war, a cataclysm. Because the, this system cannot tolerate other countries doing what we can't do. We ought to join them. We ought to be the leadership in the world in development of our economy. But you can't do it without facing the fact that we're a backward country and we have to resume our revolutionary idea of, of the uplift of man. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so in jumping ahead to your next book, uh, where would you say we went wrong? I mean, how did we get off the rails in, in this great American system that we were promoting? Well, I, I don't wanna uh, give away too much of what's gonna be in the second volume, but there was a, a huge showdown in the 1870s after Lincoln. Lincoln set the, the whole tone for the, for the next phase of everything. Uh, so Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt are the two poles of this period, this century. Uh, we had a tremendous second phase of development uh, with uh, electricity, whose development uh, through Thomas Edison was backed sponsored and mentored by a nationalist uh, 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 center uh, in, in predominantly in Philadelphia. Uh, they, there was also a push to have tremendous development of the West with several simultaneous uh, um, transcontinental railroads. Uh, we had a, a simultaneous development of Mexico going on. Uh, and we had, at the same time, the development of other countries that we were going to link up with, Japan, China, Russia, uh, and Germany, so the, the, particularly in Asia. That, that, so we were looking forward to a huge upsurge. The same, the same uh, idealistic strategists uh, also developed the petroleum industry before Rockefeller took it over. Uh, so, and, and mass production in steel and other, in other areas. Uh, Wall Street as an adjunct uh, to the city of London and to the uh, imperial system uh, fought 
to bring this whole system down. They bankrupted Jay Cook. That was not simply something that came from an overextended uh, banking uh, operation for the, with the railroads. So there was a war between the nationalists and this Wall Street London combination. Uh, more and more power was taken over by this economic royalty, the imperial system. Uh, we fought like hell to keep going. The electricity was, got, was pushed uh, despite Wall Street. They had to get, do a stockholders revolt against Morgan. And they got municipal uh, entities to make the first power plants. Edison and his backers did that. Uh, but eventually, Wall Street predominated over these industries, took over all the main industries that had been developed by this national policy that we had. Uh, we had a couple of assassinations after Lincoln's that were important, uh, Garfield and McKinley, two, two nationalists. And when you get into the 20th century, you have what is essentially a fascist empire developed that, that really started being developed in England in the late 19th century based on a whole new philosophy that you, you, we can identify really as fascism, eugenics, the whole, the whole idea of a world controlled by people with a feudal mentality. Uh, and, and so uh, where, when Roosevelt came in, uh, he personally uh, represented the founding purpose. He was a profound historian himself. Uh, it, it's embarrassing to the current leadership of the Democratic Party to discuss Franklin Roosevelt or John Kennedy because they represent a liberalism that's been abandoned, an idea of man, an idea of man's rights that they, that, that's been abandoned, it's been abandoned by both parties. Uh, where we went wrong was after FDR was uh, died, uh, there was a rush by secret services and by the financiers to, to go back to the, the, the earlier uh, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan, Wall Street uh, connection. Uh, John Kennedy went again back to his model, Roosevelt, and himself identified with the American Revolution and gave us this, the moon, sh moon program, the space program, a vision of global development with nuclear power and cooperation. Uh, after his murder, the our our, our enemies, the enemies of our, of our country and of our civilization, more importantly, uh, tried to impose a, a, a taking down of America's philosophy of progress. And that's where, that's, you can say, that's where we went wrong. The public accepted this change. It's not irreversible, despite a lot of, you know, pessimism that we have now from 50 years of, of uh, bad times in many ways. But we have to recognize that we went wrong at that point. I'm looking forward to reading your, your second book as well, and this or, or your sequel. Um, so well, I, I try to read all sides of the issues and be well versed in them. So one of my favorite commentators, who's a libertarian, I just heard him criticizing um, uh, Hamilton as or in the first u.s bank first and second u.s bank and of course he sided with jackson because they're linking it with the federal reserve and saying you know this was the beginning of our central banking system but it wasn't but it was different and i wonder if you could go into that i mean basically what i'm thinking of is the part that they supported okay. infrastructure and you know d directly invested in in the economy right all right well first of all both Hamilton and Nicholas Biddle. Hamilton, as Treasury Secretary, was guiding, you know, was was uh, proposing and then guiding the the, the first bank of the United States. Biddle uh, came in after the second bank was was already established and and provided better leadership for it. But as president of the bank, both of them had a very strong uh, outlook for the 
development and progress of the country, the uplifting of the country's uh, uh, capabilities, industrial and, and, and economic capabilities. Uh, they both understood what was wrong with the imperial system. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, Ham Hamilton's idea was based on looking at history uh, in, in England and France of, of dirigism. That is where the government, the, the, the monarchs, uh, had accomplished something, especially Colbert for, for uh, Louis XIV and Queen Elizabeth in, in England. Now, the Bank of England has some technical features that may be the same as uh, the National Bank, the Bank of the United States, but its purpose was, was fundamentally different. The Bank of England was established as part of the City of London Imperial Center to facilitate imperial commerce and speculation. And the power of the people that, that, that co-owned England with the monarchy, that, that they formed the Privy Council, they had secret societies in the, within the structure of the city of London. It's, 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 it's ghoulish, really. Uh, it's a perpetuation of feudalism. Uh, there was no purpose for development of the country. Uh, Jackson took office under really false pretenses, or let's put this a different way. He was not simply a laissez-faire ideal, ideologue. He was a politician. He was some, something of a brute. But uh, the program of uh, laissez-faire and small government or no government was not the program he ran for president on. It wasn't even until well into his, uh, his administration that he started attacking the bank. And this was guided by Martin Van Buren and by agents of the empire like uh, Churchill Cambrelling. Uh, the, the Southern slave owners demanded that we not allow uh, any kind of directed development that would change the country away from an agrarian and a, a, a slave plantation emphasis. If you develop industry, uh, modern industry and scope to the country, the slave system falls. It can't survive. You, if it's much more profitable to put your money into industry and skilled work than it is to have slaves, you can't sustain that. Your slavery it dies. And they knew that. This is always the fight that was going on. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve, remember, was established in the, uh, at the time, the, uh, just before the First World War started. What was going on then was that the United States had, had started an entirely new world system of sovereign countries, particularly with Germany, with Russia, and with Japan. And the British could not tolerate this. All, all those countries were outstripping uh, the, the British, ba uh, ba uh, led by the United States. So in order to topple that new system and bring, uh, allow them to dominate, allow their, their system to dominate, they instituted the kind of uh, reckless uh, alliances and, and, and uh, destabilization that brought about World War I and other horrors. They sponsored Japan to attack Russia. They had a military alliance with Japan. They wanted to turn these countries against each other and particularly against the United States. And so the Federal Reserve was set up at a time when we could have benefited from a bank of the United States to be rebuilt. But instead, in that environment, the power of the Wall Street London combination made this not a national bank, but, but made it a component of the Bank of England dominated uh, 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 system of central banks. This is a global system. And there, there arose after that World War I, the, possibly the most evil person that you, in history you know, certainly rivaling Hitler and a sponsor of Hitler, 
uh, named Montague Norman. Uh, he, he, he was the, the head of the Bank of England for 20 years until 1944. He instituted the first fascist government, which was in Austria. That was just before they did it in, uh, in Italy with Mussolini. And, and, and the Bank of England, through Montague Norman, sponsored all of this fascism, including Hitler, with the help of their allies in Wall Street, such as Morgan, such as Bush's father, uh, the Harriman Bank, and so forth. So the, the, the Bank of England is part of a system, a globalist system, and, and before the word globalism existed. Our bank was an instrument of the sovereignty of the United States. And somebody who says that, the, that, that Jackson was right in attacking the bank has to lie about two men. They have to lie about Hamilton. They have to lie about Nicholas Biddle. They can't tell the truth about those men. They also lie about Lincoln, right? Because well, Lincoln I think they don't know. <laughs> that's why your book is good. <laughs> well, that's true. Most people don't know. The, the, the ones who lie are the ones who are trying to uh, erase the history, the other history. Most people don't know. You're right. It's not, they're not lying. They simply, I think that Franklin Roosevelt didn't know this whole history. His own father was part of the, of the really uh, pro-Republic side of this fight. His father played a role in trying to develop the South after the Civil War as a, as a, a, a high functionary of the Pennsylvania Railroad in trying to build railroads and modernize the South. They were all defeated by the Rockefeller, Morgan, uh, uh, you know, Ku Klux Klan combination. Uh, but so, but I don't think FDR knew the whole story of Jackson and so forth. He, but he did praise Jackson and Jefferson, uh, because they are they have an image of being uh, fighters for the people against an economic royalty. Uh, what what Franklin Roosevelt did, as against these words of his, are are quite contradictory. Uh, um, yeah. I like the title of your book, "Who We Are." I mean that that actually I think is what we've lost quite a bit. People don't know our history or what what was special about the United States or where we were trying to go and what we did that was different from what had gone before. I mean, basically, we broke out of the feudalist system. And I mean, obviously, China is running circles around us in terms of infrastructure, but we still have the best Bill of Rights, I think, in the world. I mean, the fact that you can be individuals who are have your own little small business or whatever. I mean, that was the original model, of course. Now we've pretty much can, crushed. Yeah. yeah, now yeah. we've crushed the middle class, but but that's not, <laughs> or the middle class has been crushed by now. But uh, that wasn't the original system. If you had it all to do over again, I mean, to me, it's, you know, we've worked on public banks now for 10 years, and it seems like it's taken a long time, but just reading about the founding fathers and how long it took them, and they actually literally had to go to physical war to, you know, to, to create their own systems. So I think we're actually making pretty good progress. But if you, you had it to do over again, or what would you say we need now in order to restore that system, like changes in the law or whatever, antitrust? I mean, I can think of a lot of possible solutions, but. Well, there, uh, Jules Verne uh, wrote a book, uh, From the Earth to the Moon, uh, right after the American Civil War. And this West Point foundry that had been established in this story set up this gigantic cannon uh, to shoot people to the moon in this science fiction story in 1865. And this story was based on the idea that the world had gotten from the United States in that era that the USA could do anything, could accomplish miracles, uh, uh, do anything, and it's based on both this, I, this exalted idea of human rights, which includes the right to a good standard of living, and also the demand that they not be oppressed either by the government or by private power. Uh, that's a tall order. 
because how can you have progress without some sort of power to accomplish things, political uh, power? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a tall order, and we did this. We had that kind of vision and that kind of national success, and we did that several times. So uh, right now, we have to... I would say one of the one of the most important things is to recognize the change that occurred in our national philosophy. If you look at the world today, where the United States has, together with Britain and the European Union and NATO, has uh, gone into wars all over the world, has sent soldiers and agents and uh, uh, mercenaries all over the world, causing mass suffering. Uh, where did this start? How did, how did we get to this? There was a change in our philosophy. We now, as I mentioned, there's 500 million people in Africa that have no access to electricity. 100 million children basically starving. Do they have the right to a good life? Don't blame corrupt dictators in Africa or something like that. Look at our background, what we used to do, what we, how we used to see human beings. If we can look back at what we did as a, a, uh, a leader of, of progress, then we have the courage and we have the, the uh, pride to say we, we can do this, this again. But you have to admit, you have to confess that we went into a completely different philosophy as a country after the death of, of Kennedy, really the triple murder of the Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King. That, that change was illegitimate. It was based on giving up uh, the sovereignty of our country giving up the, uh, any kind of real participation in strategy making by the public. There's no discussion today about these issues. You know, you, I think an infrastructure bank is a good idea, but why don't we have it? Why isn't it, why isn't it just rushed through Congress? It's obviously a good idea. You have to confront this problem that you have a, uh, a, 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 a two conflicting philosophies in our history and throughout civilization, going back to the dawn of time, people who are builders, city builders, nation builders, inventors, uh, people looking at man as a child of the, the angels of God and people looking at man as just garbage to be abused and stolen from. Those are two sides. That's two philosophies. You don't need a conspiracy theory. That's a war that's going on all, it's the headlines throughout, right? Uh, and you can't limit it to issues. You know, somebody believes in a high tariff. That doesn't make them a nation builder. Uh, you know, Rockefeller and Morgan at some point were, were leaders of the Republican party. And they, at that point they were high tariff men but that wasn't in the same context as using tariffs and other instruments to develop the country and also saying that other countries should control their own trade as well. Nationalism in the Lincoln sense means you, you believe in the other country's right to govern themselves. So it's, a, it's an ideology. It's not, or not an ideology. It's an idealism based on this higher concept of man that it, it, it really it's a, it's a question of self-government. Right now, we do not have self-government. It's, it's obvious we don't have it. Uh, you know, some people will object, well, Russia is bad because uh, after all, at least we're a democracy. Is that really true? I don't, I don't think so. We're not, we're not, we don't have freedom of speech and the public itself is limiting their own speech because they don't, they have no connection to the ideas that are that are at the center of, of, of what's being fought about in the world. They don't have any connection to that. There was also a recent study that showed that policy is not made by <laughs> public opinion. I mean, it's not what the people want. It's actually what big the big moneyed interests want. I mean, they have so much influence in Congress that they 
control everything. So somehow we have to break out of that system. <laughs> but anyway, oh, yeah, great job of uh, encapsulating what the problem is and where we came from, who we are, and uh, what our our actual principles are and how we need to get back to those. So that's mm -hmm. great. Is there is there more you want to or do you want to sum up and tell us where to find your book and <laughs> well you can you can buy the book you know from Amazon uh, and you <laughs> or probably a bookstore can order it. Uh, it's paperback and uh, Kindle. Uh, there's a website uh, for the book uh, called whowearebook.com and you can go there to see um, the chapter summaries, 10 chapters. There's also all the picture pages in color with their educational captions. They follow each chapter. That's on the website. And there are live links to the resources, the archives. Uh, so one, one advantage the, taken of the internet is that you can, you, you, you can follow up the huge amount of footnotes uh, in the book and the bibliography to go to the archives and look at these things yourself and 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 follow follow up leads that I'm providing uh, to do your own work and have some fun with this and and start some fights somewhere and say look look at this look at this go into a college go you know talk to a professor talk to a student talk to other people to a political person look at this look who we were look who we are this is who we are we're not this nonsense that limits human rights to, to uh, uh, simply one uh, aspect of, of our lives, sexuality or, or skin color, right? What, uh, do, we, do we have the fundamental right to, to, have a, uh, to have our own government and to have a higher standard of living and to practice generosity and, and uh, 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 insp ins inspiration? that we could provide to other people, uh, other nations, and to our own population. I, I think that we could have a government based on a very large majority of support if the program was put forward uh, in, in, in the interest of the common people, the working class, the middle class, the poor people, uh, and, and any productive people at all, if it's easy to put together a program in, in that common interest and 80%, 90% of the public would support it. Imagine having a government that the people supported because it was putting forward action to and supporting action in the private sector to move our country and the rest of the world forward. That that would you could solve almost any problem with 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 that kind of a, a setup. Yeah, I, I've wondered myself about this whole competitive. I mean, capitalism is obviously good. I mean, mom and pop capitalism is good, where um, people like to play games. I mean, we like to achieve, we like to compete. That's it's satisfying, um, but. This feudalistic model that is was basically the British system. I still didn't quite get it nailed down who this was. I mean, who is it who's thinking of people as just uh, sort of slaves or as uh, you know a feudal a feudal model? Um, that's what we're trying to break out of in order to establish freedom, which is. But you need freedom along with. Um, an entity that creates stuff like a cooperative entity that builds for everybody, you know, like a free a freedom within a cooperative system that's but not totalitarian. <laughs> oh, a republic, but the, the who's the other side? I I, I centered this within uh, Britain on the East India Company as the as the best uh, way of seeing a center for this problem. Uh, there's a good quote that I have from uh, Francis Baring, the founder of the Baring Banks, a letter from him to Lord Shelburne, uh, where he says that we can make any concessions, we can make a lot of concessions to America as long as they don't pretend to be a manufacturing power. <laughs> That's a quote. And it, this quote was provided by the archivist of the Baring Banks. So it's a wonderful source. 
I, I relied on that a lot because it's their story from inside that bank. Uh, so it's the combination of the, these City of London bankers with the East India Company uh, that uh, has this vision of man being superfluous. It's not very far from saying that overpopulation causes poverty to saying it's okay to risk having a nuclear war uh, because man isn't that important anyway. It, 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 you say, well, how does that go with their interests? It doesn't, I'm sorry. You gotta face the fact that they're crazy people at, in, in the, at that level. Uh, and they, they, they're, not, they're not father figures, parents, mother figures. They are, they're not taking responsibility for mankind. Our leadership has to, and our individual citizens have to. You have to assume that kind of parental care for the future. That's what a good company is supposed to be uh, and was at our best, where you, 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 your profits and your, your vision of the future is put into building up the enterprise that's going to be, make a permanent mark for the betterment of the community and make a considerable profit that you need to accomplish something. You need to have the steam behind you to do something, right? That's the idea of our, that's, that's private enterprise. Uh, and you need that kind of initiative uh, to accomplish what, what we want to accomplish. The government has to have a, an overarching strategy. The nation has this, right? It doesn't just come from the government, but there has to be that kind of leadership like we did with the transcontinental railroads or the original canals and railroads like we did with the space program and so forth. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's not just a public-private partnership. It starts with the idea, how, how, what, is our, what is our human rights? Or do we have the right to, to live like real human beings or not? The enemy says no. We have said yes, and we succeeded at it. So let's just resume what we, what we did greatly. Well, that's great. Thank you. Can you repeat one more time where the, the your website that where we uh, who we are? The book is called "Who We Are: America's Fight for Universal Progress from Franklin to Kennedy," and it's there's a there's a web page called whowearebook.com. Okay. Most easy. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, Alan. I've been speaking with Anton Chitfin, author of Who We Are, America's Fight for Universal Progress from Franklin to Kennedy.